Okay, so it's uh, five minutes past four. Uh, I think we can start the session. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone to the industrial challenges and innovation opportunities of uh, centers of excellence in the medical and the bio and pharma sectors. Uh, this is one of the high peak uh, computing systems week uh, webinars and it's co-organized with uh, Focus uh, COE. So right now we are like uh, 34 people on the list. Uh, apologizes for the ones that were trying to access from the website. So uh, hopefully uh, everybody can uh, join from the links that were provided on the, on the email. Uh, so let's start. So uh, we'll, this, as I was telling, uh, this is a session that is organized with, uh, by uh, HITIC and Focus uh, COE. So HITIC, uh, for the ones that uh, are not that familiar, so is the network on high performance and embedded architecture and compilation uh, specialist. So uh, it's the network of specialists that, uh, with the mission to advance in advanced computing systems. Okay, and uh, we are aiming to bridge the gap between industry and academia and hardware and software communities. Uh, as for the Focus COE, so it's the concerted action for the European uh, Centers of Excellence in HPC and uh, is uh, aiming to coordinate the efforts so that uh, the Centers of Excellence uh, is uh, are uh, efficiently fulfilling their role in the uh, ecosystem of uh, the perspectives of uh, the European Commission. Okay, uh, you can check uh, more info on uh, HITIC, uh, what, is, uh, what are HITIC activities and focus COE activities in each of the websites. And uh, you are uh, also welcome to uh, follow the Twitter accounts and to follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, so what is IT community? So it's uh, basically the community of experts that is uh, driving from, that are working from the uh, low level technology and uh, hardware technologies and uh, application technologies. So all the middle, middleware, uh, and uh, all the different uh, layers in the software stack so, uh, are being worked by the uh, high tech community. On the other side, uh, so we have this focus COE community. So the centers of excellence are promoting the use of uh, the exascale and extreme performance computing capabilities uh, in order to uh, develop and optimize HPC applications. Okay, so it would be like the upper layer on the high peak uh, or what uh, is being done uh, by the community in high peak. Uh, here together, we try to focus, to narrow down the focus to the health, pharma and medical sector by bringing together the centers of excellence that are working in the applications that are in these domains which are BioExcel, PermetCoe, and uh, ConBioMed, so BioExcel for the uh, Center of Excellence for Computa Computational and Biomolecular Research, PermetCoe for the Personalized Medicine, and ConBioMed for the, for the modeling uh, community uh, applied to biomedicine and uh, computational uh, biomedicine. And we also wanted to bring together especially the industrial players in those centers of excellence. And uh, we got like uh, Nostrum Biodiscovery on, the, on behalf of uh, BioExcel, Ellen Biotech on behalf of uh, Biomed, and Atos on behalf of PermetCoe. And well, uh, all together, what we are aiming is like uh, from top to down, I try to stimulate the innovation between like, uh, industry, domain experts, HPC providers and computing system specialists in uh, this uh, biomedical health and uh, pharma vertical. 
Okay, so main name of the session, so I will recall this, uh, this uh, slide at the end, like uh, we would be aiming to check what are the main industrial challenges in this text and how these centers of excellence in HPC can help tackle them. Okay, so uh, that was the introduction in the agenda. So we, we will follow on with the brief presentation of the three uh, centers of excellence and uh, then the industrial partners. So thanks a lot. And uh, I would like to give the word to uh, Rosa Badia. Which, uh... Okay, thank you, Xavi. I'll share uh, my screens if you allow, I, my slides if you allow me. You need to stop sharing first. Yeah. Are you sharing? Um, okay. So, no. Uh, okay. Okay, can you see my, my slides? Yes. Okay, so thank you very much for the invite, invitation. Uh, I will do a bit uh, generic presentation on BioExcel, but with an emphasis on the workflows and uh, on the programming models that we are providing from BSC. Okay. So uh, BioExcel uh, is, is one of the centers of excellence, as uh, the audience will know. And in this case, of course, academia and industry in the usage and advanced techniques for HPC on computational biomolecular research. Okay. And basically, there are three edges uh, for uh, doing these activities. First, the, the area on say, scientific software, okay, where we have a set of softwares, Promax, Haddock, CP2K, and PMX, which are the, the, the software packages uh, that are uh, one of the main focus of the center, where we try to improve the performance, scalability, efficiency of these uh, codes that are very important for the biomolecular research okay and in for its use in the next uh, exascale systems okay so this is one of the edges uh, the other edge is the excellence in usability no trying to uh, uh, widen the usage of this type of, of uh, tools okay uh, trying to improve uh, the use of the ICT technologies for biomolecular researchers both in academia and industry for this, there is a large focus of the world of the center on development of workflow environments, okay? mm, which at the same time uh, perform data handling and integration of simulation. In this case, the codes that are used in the workflows are the codes that we were mentioning before. So the idea to make a more complex workflows okay? that compose uh, in part these tools, but also other tools like data analysis tools, uh, whatever uh, machine learning, data filtering, whatever is required. Okay. Uh, for this, uh, we have been developing the BioBBs, the BioExcel building blocks, for which I will explain a bit more in the next slides, and that can work with multiple uh, workflow environments like PyComs, which uh, I will be mentioning in the in the in the talk today also or Galaxy and others, okay? And the other area, uh, the other edge is the, the offering support to the area, no? to the scientists and researchers, promoting best practices and, and training, okay? In order to make uh, the best use of, of this software and the computational infrastructure that is available for the, for the community. So this is uh, by Axel in a nutshell. Uh, then I will explain a bit more uh, the activities we are doing on the workflows. And uh, for this, I will present a bit what is the bio Excel building blocks. Okay, the bio Excel building blocks or bio BBs is a set of Python building blocks. So it's uh, based on wrapper technology. It creates a new layer for compatibility and interoperability between the different tools that we were mentioning before, like for example, Gromax or PMX. Okay. And the goal is to make it easier the development of complex workflows by composing multiple of these building blocks. So the user does not need to know about the actual interface of the simulator of the actual interface of this uh, machine learning tool, whatever it can compose in a simpler workflow, all these uh, elements together, okay? And then internally are enabled by multiple workflow engines, as I was mentioning before. And for example, with PyComs, 
uh, to run them in large HPC execution. Okay. And uh, there is not only the, the main codes that we have, like Chromax, Paddock, or PMX, but other tools in general that are uh, related to the area of molecular uh, biomolecular research, but also other tools that are related to machine learning, like scikit-learn or, uh, or TensorFlow. Okay. Uh, all of this is public. You can find the URL here. I will remind of, about it at the end also. So what is PyComs? Uh, PyComs is a task-based programming model or a workflow environment based in Python that enables uh, large, uh, the execution of large workflows in HPC systems. Okay? It's able to exploit the parallelism at the level of a task and execute in a distributed computing platform. It can be an HPC system, but also can be cloud, or now we are also moving into uh, this computing continuum that they call no? from edge to cloud. Okay? And at, an aspect here is that the task can be a serial task, so it's a sequential process, but can be also multi-threaded, for example, an OpenMP process, or it can be an MPI simulation involving multiple nodes. Okay? And one of the aspects that we are focusing is in the convergence of HPC with uh, data analytics and machine learning. Okay? So trying to integrate them in the same Python environment. Okay? Uh, in this case, it's used for enabling the BioBBs, and we are releasing publicly public uh, releases every more or less every six months together with ISC and SC. You have also here the URL where they are available. Okay. Uh, some aspects is that uh, this collaboration in BioExcel has been very interesting because there are some new features of PyComs that have been thanks to the feedback that we have received in the project. No? Uh, one of the aspects that we support, as I mentioned, is the support for other programming models inside the workflow. No? So a single task can be an MPI uh, task, so then the workflow can be involving multiple uh, MPI simulations, for example, and involving a large number of nodes doing these multiple simulations at a time, and orchestrating later other uh, tasks that can be sequential or parallel at the same time for doing data analytics or for doing other type of activities. Okay? One of the aspects that was a feedback from our users and BioExcel was this uh, task level fault tolerance. No? The fact that uh, since we are running multiple tasks, maybe we are not worried if some of them uh, fail, okay? but the importance is that the rest of the workflow continues and finish. No? So now the user can specify that a task can fail and we can ignore the failure of this task and just continue executing the others. And also even cancel uh, other tasks that depend in this task can be canceled because we don't need them anymore. Okay? Or we can also provide timeouts if a simulation is taking too long and we know that it's not going to be safe, no? uh, not going to be useful. Uh, other uh, feedback that we have received, for example, in most of the jobs, in large, even in large systems, they have a maximal wall clock. Okay? So a mechanism to be able to know that we are approaching this call clock and save the workflow in a, in a safe mode and then be able to restart uh, afterwards. No? And this can be combined with traditional checkpointing mechanisms. So the BioBBs are available in, in multiple flavors. For example, you can have them available in the form of Jupyter nodes, uh, in a small tutorials, small a small demonstration, uh, uh, examples that can be available uh, in cond environments or even in my binder, which is a hosting system that allows you to run, for example, Jupyter notebooks. Okay, so you don't need to install anything. So with these tools, we can learn, we can do demonstrations, but also are available as uh, large workflows that can run in large systems. We've been in, working with all these systems uh, until now. Uh, it's not only running at BSC. Okay enabling uh, the scalability and providing uh, the, the, the opportunity of developing pre scale workflows. No? One of the examples is in this slide. Uh, last year, uh, at the time that uh, the COVID arised, uh, the workflows that we were working on were not COVID related, but we were working on this technology. And what was important is that with the technology that we have been developing, uh, the researchers involved in, in, in the center of excellence were able to move very fast into the COVID uh, research 
without changing much the way they were working. You see, all the bio BBs were ready to develop new workflows in this case that were aiming at do research on the area of understanding the evolutionary path of the virus from the bat to the humans or to predict uh, why we have this different human sensitivity to infection or in predict the impact of the, the virus mutations, et cetera. Uh, we have been working on multiple uh, workflows. In this case, we are reporting here two different ones, okay? That compute first the simulation data uh, using uh, free energy calculations, and then a combination of PMX and GROMAX to perform the actual comparison between a mutation of the virus and, uh, and, and the human receptor, for example. Okay? And this was resulted in big data simulations that uh, were received uh, appraisal location, for example. Uh, we have also done scalability studies uh, of these workflows. This is for a smaller use case than the previous uh, reported in the previous slide, but with 250 simulations. And these simulations are not totally independent between them. You can see part of uh, this graph here. So we have uh, some dependencies and some par parallelism, okay, but it's not embarrassingly parallel. In the, in the previous slide, one second. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, my, my headsets are failing from time to time. Okay, so uh, we can see it here, the scalability with the baseline being the execution on two nodes of master of Mare Nostrum, one acting as the master uh, node that uh, starts the execution and, uh, and one worker node and then increasing the number of nodes that we are using. So here you, you can see the number of cores, but this is from two until uh, 128 nodes in Mare Nostrum. And we see quite a good uh, scalability. Even uh, we have to take into account that we were not tailoring the, the problem actually to make a totally totally well well balanced problem. Okay, So here we have some load balancing problems, for example. Another type of activities that we are doing are you know, in the parallelization of machine learning, for example, in the development of the Disblip, which is a parallel machine learning library developed on top of PyCom. Okay? It's a general machine learning library and that can run in distributed computing platforms. And the important aspect that I want to uh, highlight here is that for, for the BioExcel, we have been developing some algorithms that uh, are uh, required by this community. For example, the PCA, you know, that is a, a traditional tool for dimensionality reduction, okay? And the problem is that they need to run it for very large matrices. For example, in this case, the matrix is a result of a, a large simulation for a, a molecule with more than 30,000 atoms, okay? So this, uh, right now, this does not fit uh, in the memory of one node. So we need solutions that can run on distributed computing, like is the case of this leap. Or for example, we've been working on the implementation of the Daura, Daura clustering, which is the traditional clustering that is run uh, with Gromax, okay? But in this case, again, it runs sequentially and it's limited to the memory of one node. No? So with a, a parallel solution based on this leap, uh, we can run with larger, uh, with, uh, larger problems in, in multiple nodes of a cluster, for example. Okay, so these were the more technical aspects that I wanted to cover. Then a bit about the different services that we offer to the community. No? One of the services is the support and, and consultancy, okay? And with the idea of, of make, uh, offering a tool for competence building among academia and industry, okay? Uh, promoting best practices and training. Uh, in this case, we are focusing on different type of, uh, of, of users, uh, can be academic and non-profit, but also industrial or uh, others like independent software vendors or uh, others, okay? So it's not to a single type of, of uh, users. And the training program was developed, taking into account a competency profile. So first was defined this competence profile. Then we map uh, the competencies that were needed uh, to the actual uh, training that was uh, offered. And we did a gap analysis, no? looking at which uh, train, 
training was missing, what was required, and uh, adding this to the actual program. Okay. And an, an important program uh, or important part of this program is the webinar series, which is very complete, uh, covering multiple aspects from uh, the latest developments of the software packages or introductory uh, courses to them, also on the workflows, on the usage of HPC. So it's, uh, the, the topics are very wide and right now the collection of webinars is, is quite large. And uh, just uh, to, find, to finalize, uh, there is also another activity in, this, in the Center of Excellence in uh, developing a, a BioXL enterprise, AXLE, aiming to provide uh, a vehicle in which the partners can continue to collaborate after the, the COE instrument. Okay? In this sense, uh, the, the enterprise it will not be only limited to the partners, of the project, but uh, new members, individuals, or new members, organizations uh, will be allowed to, to join. And they will be covering the services offered by the enterprises, will, will be covering different type of, of uh, aspects like so actual solutions, uh, support on the workflows, but also training, consultancy, etc., or uh, uh, solutions already packaged, ready to be used in HPC. Okay, and this is the summary. Basically, I added some, some links, important links here. Okay, and uh, just emphasize that the, the center is, is open to support uh, uh, different type of services to academia and to industry. Okay, so for example, we are looking into how to exploit uh, these workflows that right now has demonstrated to be useful to the research community, how can be exploited in the industry, for example. And that's all, thank you. So thanks a lot, Rosa, for this interesting presentation. So to, to everyone, uh, you can uh, use anytime the feature for questions and answers uh, from Zoom. So you can just click and uh, if you have any question, feel free to write it anytime. And uh, we will have like a uh, a dedicated session in the end as well for discussion to uh, cover and collect any questions and uh, as well if you got any further clarification needed rosa as well feel free to to add anytime so th thanks a lot rosa thank you thank you Chani. so next one uh, is uh, combiomet and uh, we have uh, emily lamley so the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Savi. Um, so just as a small introduction to Comp Biomed, I've kind of with my pro uh, presentation gone slightly different to uh, Rosa in that I've sort of concentrated more on the services that I think might be useful um, specifically to industry, but obviously there's, um, and, and less on the research. Um, but if you were interested more in the research side of things, then um, there's plenty of information on our website. Um, just a quick introduction to Comp Biomed. We've been running uh, since 2016, um, and we're now in the second iteration of, of Comp Biomed, um, which will run till 2023. Um, and we have uh, 18 core partners, um, ranging between acad academia, and uh, some within industry and then a couple of SMEs as well, um, as well as two international partners in the US um, who are working with us on, on certain projects. We also have an associate partner scheme in which we um, bring in people who are interested in collaborations and in the work that we do. Um, they don't benefit directly from the um, budget and, and, and uh, funding in that way, but we allow them to, to make use of, of all of our services um, and our HPC allocations and, and things like that. So you'll see at the bottom there that we have a good number of um, industrial partners and um, you know, equally as many of those are, are SMEs. Um, so we try and work together with those partners to um, bring them along together and to um, help them out, especially the, the SMEs who might not have the um, ability or the, um, the 
uh, resources to to do some of the HPC work that that they might want to do. Um, and then just quickly on our work packages. Um, so we have basically you'll see here the sort of different colors where they they match up really so work package one and six um, is all to do with engagement and training and dissemination and innovation so as, or you might think that that's the most uh, relevant here but then um, equally research and applications and the incubator applications um, work pretty I mean we all work closely together but work well together in that work package two brings up and um, uh, focuses on on the research um, side of things and then we can move that to the incubator applications if they if we feel that they are at a level where they can be um, potentially moved up to a um, spin out or a, a startup company of some kind and then uh, work package three and four deal with the more sort of practical side of things so data management and analytics and operations and services so to do with the the HPC side of things um, but equally all of these are relevant to each other and um, they work really closely together. So in terms of um, our dissemination, we have um, quite a big Twitter following, which is just growing, um, especially during Combiomed 2. Um, our YouTube followers are, are quite high as well. And we, we have regular vid videos being uploaded there, um, along with uh, a sort of a burgeoning LinkedIn uh, society of 100 just over 100 followers um, and we also have a lot of dissemination within um, sort of general public side of things so I like to think that we we, we have quite good reach for a, a wide range of, of uh, applications here and then in terms of our innovation and stakeholder relationship management we um, we have obviously most um, series have the innovation management plan we have our EEAB, which is the External Expert Advisory Board, um, and we're looking to have um, more people join that so that we can get a good idea of what people are within industry and also within the clinical side of things, so our clinical users, what they really need um, and what is important to them and how we can sort of steer uh, Comp Biomed to ensure that we, are, we continue to be um, user-driven. Um, obviously, we work closely with Focus COE and um, we're connected to a number of their networks um, and working groups and um, EuroCC, uh, which is through some of our supercomputing centres. And then within Combiomed 2, we have um, attracted some new uh, associate partners from, the, from industry. Um, some of those are SMEs and we look to, to bring in as many more um, who would be interested in our work. In terms of data management, this is something that we can definitely sort of help uh, industry and, and SMEs to, to deal with. We're taking part in a, a project with Lexis, which is um, aims to, to build advanced engineering platform between HPC, cloud and big data. Um, and we're, we've recently started a pilot test case with them. So we can definitely leverage that in, interactions um, to help our, our industrial partners um, in, in anything that they might need in terms of, of data management um, and also for secure data management because obviously in industry that's a big a big stumbling point potentially for using these um, supercomputing centers to know that their data is, is secure. Um, one of the other um, collaborations that we're um, undertake is with the DICE project um, and again that is um, for storage and data management and they offer data management services of more than 50 petabytes. Um, and this is, again, it's um, secure and it's, um, you know, we, we can pass that on to our, onto our associate partners um, as we, we progress in that uh, collaboration with DICE. And then in terms of other services, we uh, keep a, a service portfolio. Um, which is just a, an internal list of services so that we can keep a check on them um, and make sure that we keep an eye on uh, what we're putting forward, what is currently live and what we have done previously and, and maybe discontinued. Um, and then we have the service catalog, which is a, a customer facing list. Um, and these are on our website under uh, services. And with these um, come 
we've sort of put in place uh, service level agreements and operational level agreements um, and we can we can do that with industrial partners to make sure that um, anything that we work with them on is um, you know is, is safe and uh, that there's no no issues in terms of um, IP and then in terms of our compute and data services um, we yeah, we, we look very closely into this. So we create and maintain project service portfolio, as I said, um, we're looking at improving the usage of high performance computing and cloud computing. So we, we want to try and engage with industry to, to allow them to, to take on board some of the work that we do and to, to make use of it. Um, and this will then allow us to, to furnish the biomedical users with easy access to HPC and the data services um, and, and help them along with any um, support that they might need in their development. So in doing this, we've got um, a number of services on the website, as I said, one of these is the HPC allocations. So we work with our supercomputing centers, as I'm sure uh, most COEs do, and they allow us to take um, some um, allocations you know, with, with them, but then also with the price allocations, we have a number of those as well. So already in Combiomed 2, so since um, September 2019, we've used around 7 million core hours. Um, and uh, within Archer 2, with a, their six week free period, we consumed uh, nearly twice, oh, um, consumed that over again um, on their, their six week free period. So, um, you know, we're, we've got that um, infrastructure, we have that relationship with those. Um, partners and we can offer that to um, to industry partners as and when they need it. In addition, as I said, we've got the international partners, so um, Argonne National Lab and Rutgers, um, and that allows us to make use of some of the US HPC systems, such as Summit and Frontera. So these are, um, especially Summit, is very similar to the new um, pre-exascale machines that are being uh, built at the moment in the EU, which means that we can be sort of ready with our codes to run on those as soon as they, they come online. And equally, then we can pass that knowledge and that um, understanding on to any of our partners who uh, might be having trouble or might want to use those uh, types of machines. We also have the training portal and like BioXL, we have a, a number of um, webinars that we, we do regularly, uh, I don't think quite as <laughs> as often as, as BioXL, but sort of once a quarter, we put, put on a webinar. And the idea is that we we alternate between a sort of a, a more uh, operational uh, webinar. So sort of how to do things, um, data management, that side of things. Um, and then alternatively, it would be a, a particular application that we would do a sort of a run through and, and show how that works. Um, we have the next three are being just fi being finalized now and they should be up on the website soon. We also have um, a training repository, which again is just being updated. And this gives a list of any other relevant training that comes from our partner organizations um, and could be really useful um, just to sort of build up some, some knowledge or some, uh, you know, to, to fill in any, any gaps that you might have. Um, We've recently also put together this engagement portal um, termed In Silico World. Um, this is using Slack um, application and uh, or platform, and it allows um, a safe space in which we can collaborate with with people who have the expertise who can answer any questions that they might need um, that people might need. Um, specifically for CompBiomed, um, we have a scalability channel which at the moment has around 80 members. Um, and we offer free support to those people who are trying to scale up code um, and also to sort of encourage people to start talking about it. We have um, experts from within CompBiomed who sort of post an idea of what they're doing, how they're scaling up their code um, to, to, to give some inspiration maybe for, for those who are looking for it. We also have a co-design channel, which is just um, a little younger than the scalability channel. We've got around 30 members there. And again, it's just a, a safe space to, to discuss and, and um, talk about how we could go about um, co-design in terms of hardware and software. We also have the visitor program. Um, so this allows for exchanges between 
any of our partners, really core partners, associate partners, or people who are interested. It will allow up to 5,000 euros for expenses towards the visit, and that can be from one week to three months. All we ask is for a short proposal. The more money that you're asking for, the longer we ask for the proposal, just so that we can ensure that um, that aligns with, with our objectives as a COE, and um, it's, it's going to benefit everybody. Obviously, during um, the current time, this hasn't been able, hasn't been possible to, to um, facilitate, but we do have the funds there, and we're hoping to really push that a bit further um, in the in the coming um, months to to ensure that that we can really help people out and and, and get them moving and sharing knowledge. And finally, just a, a quick um, sort of plug. Really, we've got our Comp Biomed conference, which we're going to be hosting online um, in September. And we really would like to, um, to get some industry partners. We're gonna have a, um, an exhibition, a virtual exhibition hall, um, which is a really, it's a, the, the platform that we're using is a really nice, has a really nice way of doing it where you can put, it, it looks almost like a normal booth and you can have chat um, while you're there as well. So it could be a really good opportunity. We're hoping to, to, to get between three and 400 people at the, at the conference. Um, so you may be able to sort of interact with some more people. Um, we've got our, our sort of upcoming uh, external expert advisory board meeting. Um, oh, it should be June, sorry. <laughs> That's June this, this year um, during our um, all hands meeting. And again, that's gonna be virtual, but hopefully next time we can meet in person again. Um, and then some ideas for, for the future is sort of a matchmaking event where we would like to introduce SMEs to larger companies where they can explore how to work together um, and potentially offer the SMEs some work that they can do for, the, um, for these larger companies and, and see how they can, they can sort of help each other out. And also we're looking for any other suggestions. So what, what, do, what else would SMEs need from us? How can we provide it and how can we potentially in the future, then measure those benefits with them and, and work with them uh, further. And um, with my 15 minutes up, uh, just to, to say thank you for, for listening. And these are all of our um, identifications uh, if you want to try and find us anywhere. Thank you. Okay, so th thanks a lot, Emily. So uh, I welcome you as well to Share the information of the event that you were that you were presenting uh, in due time, so that uh, we can also help you to, to promote them when uh, you start uh, the registrations. And uh, and yes, uh, let's recall on your questions and what are the SMEs uh, expecting. Uh, maybe we can discuss it uh, in the end as well. Okay. Thank you. So thanks a lot. So next uh, one should be Permet uh, Coe, so with uh, Alfonso Valencia. So hello, Th thanks a lot thanks. for being here and sharing your your knowledge and uh, wisdom. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. I will uh, try to explain what we plan to do in uh, Permet Coe. Uh, let me share my screen if I can. So uh, first I have to say that we are uh, a, a relatively new uh, center of excellence. We, we are uh, not even six months into operations. So we are uh, not as, as, as advanced in many aspects of uh, we are here from, from the other two uh, center of excellence. So many of the things are still, uh, we are still setting uh, many of the, of the things we, we want to do or we are going to do. Um, so the, the partners are uh, covered uh, two centers of excellence, two, two high performance centers, uh, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center at the CSC and our colleagues in Finland. We have a number of uh, institutes that are on the computational biology side of things. So they are developing software uh, and that is what we are um, uh, using and uh, scaling up in the, in, the, in the center of excellence. And then we have a number of uh, big and small companies 
also as partners of the project. Um, the goal of uh, Permetcoe is to make uh, is personalized medicine. So it's all the connection between the genomic information, the medical information, uh, trying to, to make this information um, in a sense computable and being able to build uh, mechanistic models based on this information that can be useful for biologists and biomeds. So the project is very much focused on uh, this type of genomic type of information and the intention of making uh, scaling up these systems to, to really make them uh, useful in the context of uh, medicine and biomedicine. Why, uh, why another center of excellence in, uh, in, uh, in this domain of biology or, or medicine? This is the way we, we see that. It's a little bit of a simplification, but I think it may help to, to understand that. We have here from, from BioExcel, from Rosa, uh, what they are developing in BioExcel, uh, molecular models uh, with uh, mainly with two very popular uh, software packages with Gromax and Haddock. This means all the atomistic level, how proteins are moving, how drugs can be binding to the proteins. And she shows some beautiful examples of the, of the work done uh, in COVID-19. At the other level, we have Comp Biomed, and we have uh, uh, here from them uh, some of the things they are doing. I, I hear, I'm sure that we will hear more about uh, some of these developments at the level of simulations of full organs, in this, in this case, uh, heart and, 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 um, and, and, and blood, and, and blood uh, flows. Uh, these simulations are very interesting for medicine because they are at this level of uh, you know, medical type of uh, imaging uh, in, uh, in diseases, analyzing in organs at this level. In between these two levels, between the atomistic level and the organ level uh, is all the biology, all the cellular biology and all the molecular biology, all the type of uh, interactions that happen inside the cell or between cells. And this is where we are placing the permet coe in this type of uh, uh, data and simulations where things are happening at the molecular level, connecting genomes with uh, cellular processes and cellular interactions. So the three of uh, the way I see that is the three of us, we cover the full scale of uh, biological phenomena from the atomistic level to the organ level. And now we place, we cover this big hole that was there with the new center of excellence in this uh, uh, cell level type of simulations. Why this? I think there are two uh, um, technologies that uh, has uh, flourished in the last uh, three, four years, and they are going to change the way uh, we understand biology and the way we do uh, medicine. The third one is a single cell genomics. This is the capacity to analyze what is happening at the real level, at the level of uh, uh, action, at the level of metabolism, at the level of uh, signaling, by sequencing the RNAs of single cells. So the picture on the left uh, is a real picture from a, a tumor of a person which the individual cells, or a few thousand of cells, has been individualized, and we have now information about what is going on in each one of them. And then we see different type of cells and we can analyze the tumor at this level. In the other stream, we have organoids. This is the technology to be able to reproduce, still with limitations, but very powerful, the behavior of cellular systems in the lab. So we can reproduce, for example, the growth of it. We can start thinking, simulating in the, in the lab, reproducing in the lab, the growth of a, of a, of a tumor or the, the consequences of mutations for the formation of a given organ. These two new technologies are what allows us to think that we can use the information from single cell, simulate what is, what is going on in the individual cells, what is, what is going on in between different cells. So in the tumor, for example, the, the 
competition and collaboration between the different cells in the tumor, and the, each one of them with their individuality and with the individual contact with other cells, and then compare and learn these, uh, these uh, results with real organoids in which in the lab, part of this process has been simulated by experiment. So new technologies that empower us and may say, makes possible to think in, com in comparing and using simulations to understand this process at this molecular level. So our ambition is to, to be able to use this type of simulations from cells to processes like a tumor, to be able to use these simulations and to change the way biologists are working right now, being able to connect the experimental data, the single cell data with the results. In what happened in, a, in this tumor uh, during the evolution of this tumor when a drug uh, is entered uh, to stop the tumor, the tumor growth. So that's the ambition to, to be able to provide biologists with these type of tools that will help them to understand, in this case, what are the consequences of the administration of a drug uh, uh, to a patient uh, with, with cancer. Obviously, uh, that will imply, in a sense, being able to manipulate different type of information uh, that are, uh, in the case of, uh, of a tumor, influencing uh, in ways things that we measure about the tumor, and also uh, making these models and being able to reproduce the very complex behavior of tumors in different situations. This is the, the aim. Obviously, we are still not there, and the simulations that we can do right now are uh, more similar to this type of picture. We are simulating a tumor with different type of cells. Uh, the colors will represent different uh, the, the, the evolution of different cells in this tumor from the one that are still growing, the one that are targeted by, by a drug and the one that they are dying. And each one of these cells will be at the same time reproducing or will reproduce in each one of these cells a number of processes, signaling, metabolism, regulation that are um, the mechanistic inside the cell that, are, that is providing the survival to the cell or the reactions to the different drugs or environmental conditions. So the, 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 the full environment will be reproducing, uh, we will produce simulations for what is going inside the cell and what is going on in between the cells. To do that, we have to start by uh, collaborating and they are partners in the project, the developers, of the, meth, the simulation methods at three different levels. Simulations at the level of cellular metabolism, what the products are consumed to produce energy. Simulations at the level of signal transduction, uh, how a hormone gets to the surface of the cell and this trigger the division of the cell. Simulations at the level of um, regulation, how the um, cascade of regulation in the third works and stochastic simulations to uh, produce combine this data and all that is in the framework of an agent based simulation of cell cell interactions. These are four different type of software. Each one of them is by now developing a different system, different language, different environments. And the first thing we are doing is to put this under a similar framework, being able to scale this uh, software to be able to, pr to produce large scale simulations in the, of, the, of the things that are going in the, on in the individual cells and then of the intercellular communications. If we are thinking about this type of tumor simulations, uh, the one I, uh, one I have been using as an example, the, to place the aim in a single way, we want to be able to simulate a thousand million cells, the evolution of a, a thousand million cells uh, in a tumor under different conditions that are including different treatments. So it's the response to a tumor that is of a, the size of uh, these uh, thousand million cells to the different, to the different treatments. So this is one of the use cases we are, uh, we are developing in PERMED-COE. There are others, the other ones are obviously, we are um, not only based in the simulations in single cell data, we are also using uh, other type of, um, of omic data. So these are cancer diagnoses based on other omic information. One of the purpose of these simulations is to explore drug synergies. 
So not only what are the consequences of the treatment with a single drug, but the consequences of combining treatments, that's something that is very much needed in a number of therapeutic areas, cancer in particular. And we are extending this not only to cancer, but also to uh, rare diseases when the problems are uh, more of um, more the diagnosis than the treatments at this level. Finally, we added a case on multi-scale modeling of, uh, of coronavirus. Where we are simulating the evolution of the cellular types, different type of cells, with respect to the uh, immune system and different treatments. I can use these uh, use cases to, uh, to explain what type of uh, companies uh, we will try to enroll and we are start discussing at these different levels. So the idea is that uh, in the case of the, the simulation of the tumors, we will obviously talking about cancer research and the companies we are talking here to are companies in the biotech se sector or companies that are developing technologies for the use of omic data or the companies developing organoids or the research group developing organoids in which that can be interested in uh, the simulations to understand the evolution of the systems and, 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 uh, and how to uh, manipulate them. In the case of the use of omic information in cancer, cancer research, this is the, the, the one that is closer to the standard practice in, in, cancer, uh, in cancer care. And then we are talking to hospitals, obviously, because they are the ones that are uh, using this omic information to provide treatments, as, as well as to the uh, companies developing software uh, to, to help the clinicians to take decision, decision support systems. Drugs and uh, synergies, this is a very obvious uh, relation with clinical trials and the companies that are interested in this type of problems are obviously the pharma companies trying to understand how to provide and drug combinations that are more effective. Finally, the case of rare diseases is probably uh, more related with the big European uh, programs in this area and also with the interest of the patients' organizations looking for uh, fast tools to provide diagnosis in these uh, in rare diseases. Normally, uh, the example that we are um, using are uh, child uh, cancer uh, are part of these rare diseases. So that's um, a little bit of the overview of our, uh, the, the use cases we are developing and uh, how we are uh, using this to connect them to the, to the potential uh, end users of these technologies. And uh, that's it from, from my side. So again, uh, I think we, we, we feel a, a, a gap that is very much needed in, in biomedical research and in biomedical applications with this type of simulations at the cell and intercellular level. We are a new COE, so we are still just, just starting those activities. Uh, I focus the presentation more than in the, in the high performance technology and the developments in the, in the applications, because I think this will be for us the, the, the way of connecting with, um, with the clinical environment, with the medical environment, and with the companies developing products in this area. Thank you. Okay, so th thanks a lot for this uh, interesting uh, presentation as well. Uh, as well, you can recall that you are starting, but uh, I think uh, it's very promising, but uh, I think that, uh, you're presenting and uh, and well, uh, it's uh, it's going to be worth to be seen how you are aiming to engage uh, SMEs and you are going to engage uh, the companies in the future because I can recall it can really attract a lot of interest. So maybe we can go to the second side of the of the presentation uh, of this uh, session. So, uh, so far we have seen, so what are the offerings, what is being done on this uh, Center of Excellence Arena. Uh, so now uh, let's see what uh, the industrial partners and SMEs, uh, so what's, what's their view and what are the needs that are being covered by those uh, Center of Excellence. Okay, so first we will have uh, Nostrum Biodiscovery. 
Okay, and uh, it's presented by Ali Hosteini. And uh, well, welcome on board as well. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you. Thank you for the inviting. This is Ali from uh, Nostrum Bio Discovery company, and um, I'm going to give you a short presentation about the company and how um, we going to solve some problem in the challenging of the industrial problem in, in uh, biopharmas company. Um, as everyone knows, um, the, the one of the most important challenges in the, in the biopharma companies are um, just uh, saving time and money to, to get on the target, to reach the target. So in the company, in uh, Nostrum by Discovery, um, we give services to pharma and biotech company. Um, we have like a team software and hardware uh, potential. The team that we have are experts in um, both side academic and, and industrial. They have extensive experience in these two parts. Uh, we have several software and applications um, using a different division in a company. Uh, we have two different parts of the applications. Uh, some of them are our application and software and the techniques and some uh, the third parties. We have the facility of hardware, uh, like the bio, um, supercomputing and cluster that we use for around every, every project. Uh, the software that we can we use in the, in the company are, are two parts, as I said, uh, the own software, basically called Pele, uh, artificial intelligence uh, suits, PyDoc uh, program, Chemistrix, and the uh, package or suite of EDMD. And the third party software uh, that we have licenses that we use for molecular modeling uh, included Schrodinger and Gromax. So um, the, the hardware that we have is, is like a, a cluster that we're using and uh, we are able to run uh, between 2,000 to 4,000 uh, jobs per day by using these clusters. Um, the, the company basically has three different divisions. Uh, one focusing on drug discovery, second enzyme engineering and nucleic acids. In uh, these three divisions are not independent. Uh, when we have a project uh, and collaborate with the, with the client in the industry, we uh, share the expertise, we share the experience, we share the, the, the techniques. And based on the IT department that we have, we customize the techniques based on the client's needs. So the, uh, the basic and the fundamental application or software that we have and use it called Pele, Protein Energy Landscape uh, Exploration. This, uh, this program, uh, it's, it's a Monte Carlo-based algorithm. It's very fast and tested uh, in several academic and, and industrial projects. Um, basically, this program works like um, the, the movement and perturbation of the system. It can be enzyme, it can be a protein receptor uh, interaction between protein and ligand, how they move and, and uh, how they interact. And after perturbation and, and the fluctuation of the system, uh, they do a minimization and uh, such a relaxing the system. And then based on the, the metropolitan criteria, the movement will accept or reject. Um, so on the top of this, this application, uh, we. Uh, developed several different techniques that uh, use in different uh, or separate division. Uh, we share this application within division, but most of them using just in, in a specific project, like in this feed, pellet DNA, protein-protein interaction, frac pellet, or, or GPCR direct evolution, for example, just using enzyme engineering and, and pocket exploration. As an example, for example, in drug discovery uh, division, we use several applications. These applications mostly use for um, lead identification and uh, uh, to see how a uh, drug uh, bind to the, to the target, the ligands, uh, protein ligand interaction, how the, this protein or how these ligands can enter a pocket of the protein, how can uh, exit, how we have, we have uh, um, techniques just using especially for GPCR protein, 
And uh, also we have another application for pocket exploration, which is um, uh, searching for the binding mood of the small molecule on the surface of the protein. Um, you know the, another division, as I said, uh, is enzyme engineering. In this uh, division, we use different application to see um, the uh, behavior of the enzyme. We do enzyme engineering, we do mutation of the enzyme based on, uh, based on the, the require of every project that we have. We can, uh, with application, we can see the, uh, the uh, behavior of the enzyme when we do mutation, how it uh, how we can increase the stability, how we can increase the activity. And uh, one of the new line that we have in enzyme engineering called Plurizyme. This Plurizyme uh, uh, makes us uh, able to have two uh, binding sites in the same enzyme. This, this application is very interesting for the biotech companies to save money and time to um, uh, have it like to uh, the same uh, active site or binding site on the enzyme, or they, they can also have two different binding sites and then uh, they can just uh, run the same cascade, the, the, the cascade with the same enzyme. Um, in the, the last division that we have in the, in the company is nucleic acid uh, division. In this, in this division, we use like pellet DNA, protein protein traction package and PyDoc program uh, to see the derogability of RNA, to, to see how um, RNA bind to, the, to a small molecule bind to the RNA and DNA simulation. We do different, different uh, projects in this field and we use this program. But as I said, all these divisions are, are connected, are, are uh, dependent and we share the, the techniques but everything can be customized here. We customize all the application based on the, the, the collaboration that we have. So um, how, how we, we collaborate with, for example, the, the, our partner BioXL to help these challenges. For example, in BioXL, they have different workflows and, and subject that we, uh, as NBD company, we can be involved in, in some of this, this um, criteria. We can uh, be involved in the training, customizing. Uh, we can test and, and uh, develop and validate the program in, in the, the workflow uh, in the, in the BioXL. We can have a feedback from the industry uh, and, and bring it to the academic and we can, we can just test this problem. We can develop program to, to solve some, some uh, problem in, in the industry's part. And uh, we, we collaborate uh, with, with academic as well to see how we can, we can uh, tackle these this, uh, challenges. And thank you, thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Ali. So, uh, meanwhile, so to everyone, so if you are welcome to keep on posting questions or any kind of suggestion that uh, you might have on the way. So, thanks a lot, Ali, for for this presentation, and uh, we can also recall like some uh, comments for the later discussion. So, next uh, panelist, yes. So next uh, panelist is Mariano Vazquez from uh, LM Biotech. So welcome, and uh, it's a pleasure for us to have you presenting here. It's always very interesting your, your contributions. But, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Javier. Uh, hold on, uh, okay, let's hear. Let's go. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> um, I, I I like to start my presentation with this with this slide about the future of medicine. It is something that uh, one of the comments in the in the chat was uh, about this about real life applications. The I, I I always like to start my presentations in this way because this is the future of medicine now. It is something that it is happening now, so the future just came, and the applications that I will show <clears throat> are applications that are. For real life right now so this is is not science fiction is is uh, something that it is happening now so i like to present this as in a <clears throat> like in a <clears throat> like a pyramid so at the bottom layer of the pyramid is my nostrum this very large computer that we have here in bsc you already know the large computer that it is my nostrum hosted by 
Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which is in the next layer. So you all know what is a Barcelona Supercomputing Center. A um, couple of figures is about, it's a, a bit more than 600 researchers right now. It's the Spanish uh, public uh, research center on supercomputers. And it was created in 2005. At the next layer is the ALIA development team. So it is a bit less than 10% of the researchers of VLC are uh, belonging to the ALIA development team. Uh, we are mathematicians, physicists, engineers, programmers. I'm here at this, uh, at this meeting, which is <clears throat> uh, closely uh, related to bio, but I'm not a biologist by, by training, I'm a physicist. Um, and the, our team started at 2005 as the, as the center. And, and we started being two, now we are 50. Um, and at the very, very top of the pyramid is Ellen Biotech, which is the spin-off company of, of BSC. Uh, we develop biomedical software technology for doing in silico clinical trials. The, our, what we do is deployed in, the, in high performance cloud or supercomputing centers. And as um, we, are, we are focusing at cell tissue and organ level. The, the idea is that this the technical challenge is that what we want to do is to recreate biological systems in a, in a computer, but the more complex the system is, the larger the computer you need. But the larger the computer you need, the more efficient the code must be to take profit of this large computer. The, the background on Alia, well, <clears throat> Alia is, the, is the, the tool that we, the, the core tool of LM Biotech. So Alia is a parallel multi-scale simulation code that is using several verticals uh, like industry related projects like aerospace, energy, environment, and biomedical. This is one of the, our favorite verticals and it is the vertical which is, uh, to which uh, LM is devoted. So it is important to note that, that Alia is the only multi-physics multi-scale code for biomedical use at organ level that was born and developed in a supercomputing center. This is uh, to show that we are not more intelligent than others, but the fact is that we've been being, the code being born and developed in a supercomputing center made us uh, put on us a very restringent condition on the efficient use of the supercomputer. And that's why what we, we do what we do. So in, in biomedical, uh, the biomedical realm, we started a few years ago to, as a game, to group everything that Alia, everything in which Alia is used for the biomedical, we put a color, red color. Uh, for instance, for things that are done in, in environment, it is green, Alia, Alia green. But well, what started with the game then became almost a trademark. So Alia red is what is commercialized by, by, commercialized by Yellen Biotech. What we do are simulation tools for biomedical research. The goal is to do in silico clinical trials. We are focused at organ and tissue level. Not every problem in biomedical research requires supercomputers, but for those in which, uh, for those in which supercomputers are required, that's where we are. We started focusing on cardiovascular and we are right now very, very focused on cardiovascular, but we do things also in respiratory system. Um, we, are, we have pretty advanced solution for respiratory system too. And our customers are pharma, medtech, but, uh, but we, we have a vocation also for that uh, directly clinicians can use our, our code, also CROs, but well, anyway, this is the, the road that we, that we choose. Um, for the FDA, they have uh, a vision. So today, or, or un, until a um, very, very few years ago, Every medical device that want to pass the, for pharma is more or less the same, but every medical device that want to pass, go through a regulatory process, must pass through these tests. Tests on laboratory, human and animal, and a small bit of computer, computer things. But things are changing. And now the human, animal and laboratory are reduced a lot or the, the, the vision is that they're going to be reduced a lot, not disappearing, but reduced a lot and more targeted. Computer is going to grow a lot, but also it appears this new guy. This new guy is virtual patient. So this introduces a, a complexity boost. 
So now the model is, now what we want is not just to model the isolated therapy, but doing it on the patient, which means that in order to do it properly, you need to include the system, the organ, tissue, the cell in your model, which implies a comprehensive modeling uh, in which you have to, you would like to take into account comorbidities of the patient, the, 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 the very patient variability, um, things like that. And also requires specific in vivo and experimental validation on, con on, diff on the different context of use. This is not like, you know, as we are, our code is used, for instance, in aerospace. In aerospace, if you want to do a, a validation, you just put a probe in, the, in, in a wing of an aircraft in a wind tunnel and you measure things. But you can't do the same in, the, in a human body. You can't measure whatever you want. And worst of all, as we like to say, nature is not a CAD user. So you cannot have the CAD, your CAD. And, and to create our simulation uh, scenario. So we need to uh, create a simulation scenario from images and data that can, can be taken from the, from the doctor. So it is not that easy and you need a very specific uh, validation on, on the different context of use. So I will give you a couple of examples for you to get a better idea of the things that we do. Uh, on the cardiovascular system, we have many collaborators. I like to put this, even if you don't read it, but. The, the fact is that what is interesting is that the kind of collaborators that you need to do these sort of things, not just academia, but also medical devices, companies, regulatory bodies, hospitals, and hospitals are very important because the clinicians are those that are kind of taking the reins of what we, of what we do. They are posing the questions and they are asking us for the proper answers to the question. It is not, a, and this is related to the first slide. It is not, just science fiction is something that is driven by the real necessities of the of the doctors and the stakeholders, <clears throat> biomedical stakeholders. So this is an example of the kind of things that we do. This is a, a pacemaker, which is uh, it's a it's a which is called Micra. It's a very sophisticated one in which the the full pacemaker goes pinned inside the ventricle. So it is something that can it is deployed in your heart through a catheter, and it is. Um, it is attached to the inner wall of the of the right ventricle. So this is this small, this thing here, this red thing here is the is the pacemaker, and it is used for something which is called a ventricular block, in which the in cardiac resynchronization therapies, in which you have it, um, you have a very bad impairment on the on the initial activation on the on the heart. So this is the, the simulation, the movie of the simulation. So here, what you see is the, the, our code, what simulates our code and, and can predict is the electrophysiology. So the heart here is colored by electrophysiology. It's the electrophysiology which unleash the mechanical contraction of the ventricles. And then this mechanical contraction on the ventricles makes the, the blood flow inside. So what they, inside the ventricles and pump pump out the, the blood. So what the um, medical device company was to see different things in the, in the pacemaker. At what extent this pacemaker can perturb the flow inside because it is relatively large. Uh, so at, at what extent it can perturb the flow and, and especially if there is any uh, thrombogenicity effect on by putting this, by placing this inside the, the ventricle. Also, they wanted to see the forces and how the, how the pacemaker move the forces because they don't want, of course, they don't want to that the pacemaker get loose in your body. So it must be attached firmly to the to the inner wall of the of the ventricle. And finally, uh, last but not least, where do you need to put the, the pacemaker in order to get a proper activation pattern for the heart? This is another example. The other example I wanted to show you. This is an example of um, uh, you know that some maybe you have heard a few months ago about different drugs that uh, are anti-malarial drugs that are given for administered for um, to to heal a uh, covid disease on you so the um, these these were old anti-malarial drugs that has well known cardiac risk effect cardiac risk means that if you take some depending on the dosage and depending on your physical condition you can have uh, dangerous arrhythmias. So what we are doing here is using our model. We, um, we 
administer to this virtual patient different, uh, different concentrations of um, chloroquine, and we observe the effects, if there is some cardiac effects. What is very interesting is that there are some papers that are, um, that are uh, reporting problems that people have, and the, the statistical results that we have in our uh, virtual patients, uh, in our silico trial on, the, on our virtual patient, is very, very similar to that that is taken on, that is um, reported on, on real humans. So with that, we are very, we are very happy with this, with this example. Now, a few conclusions um, is this, again, this is, um, this is not, uh, this is not science fiction because HPC is mature enough. You know, we are discussing here three different centers of excellence. We are, we have Nostrum Biodiscovery, we have Elm, and we have Atos. And we have it, which means that it is mature enough to be used. Uh, the algorithms, the solution schemes, implementation strategies, the different mathematical models, programming models like the one that Rosa uh, shown, um, hardware and the availability of hardware, software and the availability of, of hard of software, also the input data sets. So this is not science fiction. This is the main idea. It is happening now and it is happening, well, in a very interesting uh, way. Um, in any case, there is a lot to be done, especially a lot to be done on increasing the confidence in these tools, because the question will, will always be, at what extent this is, uh, do we have the confidence to use it? But this is something that happened in other fields and it is happening like aerospace, energy, climate. We are not discovering the, we are not reinventing the wheel. Um, so, well, industry and government are, are very important to fuel the, the, the pace. And more hands are needed on every respect, clinical and medical insight, of course, with mathematical model, modeling, computer science experts, co-design with hardware architects, uh, whatever. So these are my conclusions and, and thanks a lot for, uh, for your attention. So thanks a lot, Mariano. It's very, very interesting insights on, on how these uh, real applications and how this uh, as you say, it's no longer science fiction, but uh, it's like a real business and a real life uh, uh, application of, uh, of uh, how the Center for Excellence as well have been helping to, to progress. And, uh, and, uh, so I think uh, both uh, in LM Biotech and uh, in Nordstrom, we have very nice examples for this. And uh, well, we jump now to the, our last uh, presenter, that is Elena Gonzalez from Atos. So we got the example from two SMEs. So now we got the example from a big company. And uh, let's see how uh, does uh, a big company as well, like uh, leverage the center of excellence and uh, also uh, which offering uh, they have. Okay, so. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, thank you for the, this invitation. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, I will talk a little bit about the main uh, trends that are now more extended in the healthcare industry. Next, uh, I, I will talk a little bit as uh, the main technology trends. Uh, also, uh, the uh, the personalized the, the link between the personalized medicine and HPC technologies, and finally, um, I will mention the how Permedco is going to be validated uh, using the use cases. So, well, when we talk about impact in healthcare industry, uh, we uh, need to talk mandatory about the COVID epidemic. Uh, so uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, had been uh, disruptive on every corner of the healthcare industry uh, and on every group of stakeholders. Um, for example, here in this slide, we have the different groups of stakeholders. We have the service providers. They would be mainly healthcare professionals. And the main impact in their case, uh, well, they had been on the front line and increasingly overwhelmed, and um, 
Uh, they had experimented a high stress and, and risk uh, while the use of telehealth raises. Uh, next, uh, we could have uh, the impact on products and services uh, suppliers. So uh, the suppliers of disease-related products uh, face, has faced an enormous demand as they undergo disruptions in their supply chain and employee operations, while other medical product suppliers uh, has faced major disruptions. So uh, non-COVID product suppliers are witnessing a deterioration in product demand and cash flow. Next, we have to talk, of course, about the, the patients. We have to distinguish uh, between the COVID-19 patients, uh, which has faced, uh, now are facing the post-COVID after effects. Uh, meanwhile, vaccines has initiated a new uh, post-COVID phase. And from another side, uh, we have to talk about the non-COVID patients, which has faced a limited access to physicians, treatments, as resources are still addressed to COVID patients. Uh, we also have the impact on payers, public and private payers. Uh, they have been adapting to critics while being financially impacted. And finally, uh, we have to talk about the impact on medical authorities and, oh, sorry, yeah, medical authorities and regulators, because uh, the management of the crisis by the health authorities uh, varies uh, widely by country. So now we can compare uh, between countries the management of the same crisis. Uh, for example, the USA has been slow in implementing social distancing and screening, but the FDA has surpassed the EMA in approval of emergency treatments. So uh, a huge uh, impact on the healthcare industry that we are, we are still measuring. We still are not aware about the, all the consequences. So. The second trend uh, would be uh, consu consumerism. And what does consumerism mean? Well, it means that when a user of a healthcare service uh, when an, a user uses a, a healthcare service, these users want uh, the same level of service that they have in a different uh, sector. So uh, now the healthcare users uh, want a good customer experience. Uh, they want a variety of facility-based access points. Uh, they want digital tools, price transparency, uh, variety of virtual access points. So uh, health systems uh, should ask themselves if they are ready to compete in this new landscape, totally new for the healthcare industry that it is not so used to compete in this way. And the second third uh, would be social issues. Uh, this means uh, socioeconomic information that now is part of the care process. Uh, for example, where a patient resides, um, its employment, family situation. So uh, now uh, the social determinants of health um, uh, could be part of the diagnosis because uh, they impact mortality, morbidity, life expectancy, healthcare expenditures, and health status and functional well-being, uh, for example. They cause major disparities in health and healthcare. So now uh, health systems have the insight to improve care across underserved categories. And now uh, let, let's talk, let's talk uh, a bit about the uh, technology because it is our main issue. So the, the trend number one uh, would be telemedicine. Uh, it provides an easy accessibility and uh, the, well, the easy accessibility and the availability of electronic records has contributed to improve communication between the patients and the doctors. And we can say that uh, real-time monitoring is one of the major achievements of telemedicine. Next, we could talk about the Internet of Medical Things. Combining Internet of Medical Things with telemedicine uh, has led to a massive change in the way that healthcare organizations work. It can help with additional data collection, uh, but also with the process giving extra care to the analysis of symptoms. Uh, just um, two numbers uh, to understand the, the huge uh, impact of this. 
Uh, between 20 and 30 billion of these type of devices are expected to be deployed by 2021. So it is a, a big challenge also in terms of security. Uh, the number three could be a cloud computing, uh, which has actually helped in the administrative tasks and maintenance of the infrastructure of many healthcare organizations. The healthcare se sector uh, has been traditionally reluctant to adopt uh, the cloud computing services, but cloud computing uh, has improved a lot in terms of uh, privacy and security to satisfy the high requirements of the healthcare industry. And the um, healthcare industry has started to adopt this type of services uh, for the storage. So uh, we will see this trend very strong in the next future. Uh, another one, uh, the introduction of augmented reality and virtual reality, which has led to the improvement of the patient experience. And now doctors can get their diagnosis down with much precision by being able to check each and every detail of different body parts. And of course, it has also proven to be useful in terms of teaching. Of course, we have to talk about artificial intelligence because it's everywhere. Uh, it has helped with medical research. It has improved the process of testing new drugs for their efficiency and usage. It has also improved the process of diagnosis and the data collected can be analyzed with the help of artificial intelligence uh, to offer actionable insights. The chatbots. Uh, with the help of automatic chatbots and voice messages, a particular institution can reduce costs and increase efficiency at the same time. Uh, we can use these chatbots, for example, as friendly reminders, uh, for example, for older patients, patients suffering Alzheimer's, and uh, it will provide 24-7 accessibility to patients in case of any emergency. So they could be uh, really useful to communicate with users. Another trend uh, would be data science and predictive analytics. So this uh, trend is related uh, with artificial intelligence, also with personalized medicine, and uh, to analyze uh, information in the future, uh, sure will save uh, the lives of thousands of people. Uh, blockchain, uh, because it, it is, blockchain is, has been one of the biggest uh, technological innovations of the last decade. As you know, it provides a secure platform that has enabled transactions and information to be shared between various stakeholders with, uh, without any third party being involved. Uh, it, is, it is not clear at this moment uh, an specific application for health using blockchain, but health uh, industry is interested on its huge uh, potential uh, because it, pro it ensures the anonymity of the users and ensures cost effectiveness and, in and improve accessibility. So let's see what happens with blockchain in the research of healthcare industry. And finally, of course, uh, we would have the personalized medicine. It integrates information from uh, multiple sources. Uh, it offers uh, tailor-made prevention, diagnosis and treatment. Uh, it allows to treat patients with the therapies that work best for them. It, drive health, it drives healthcare innovation, establishing Europe as a global leader in healthcare industry. And it avoids adverse reactions to medicines. Uh, there has been significant European Union investments in research on personalized medicine uh, during last years. Uh, just uh, two examples. The first one would be the Seven Framework Program. Um, there was an investment of 1,334 million of euros on uh, 209 projects on personalized medicine. And uh, for example, in Horizon 2020, just the first three years, uh, we can talk about uh, an investment of 872 million of euros on uh, 167 projects on personalized medicine. 
so uh, with regards uh, uh, just uh, to give you an idea, an idea of the impact of personalized medicine our days uh, we, this is a this is a screenshot from uh, four years ago uh, about a personalized cancer vaccines and the mentioned companies uh, have been uh, biotech that is the company which uh, uh, created uh, the, the Pfizer vaccine uh, of COVID and also Moderna. So uh, that gives an idea of uh, how um, the, the most cutting edge companies, the, the most promising companies um, are involved in personalized medicine. So uh, now with regards to the, what is the link between personalized medicine and HPC technologies? So, well, personalized medicine promises a breakthrough in our ability to fight illness at the individual level. We need to improve our capacity to predict the course of diseases after uh, possible treatments, to deal with the challenges of developing accurate models based on vast amounts of personal medical data. We need to adapt the current modeling tools to the new practice scale environments. Up to now, HPC community has provided software for organ level simulations. That's the case of the Center of Excellence uh, Combiomed, as we had seen. Next, we would have uh, molecular uh, simulations. Uh, that's, uh, uh, they are promoted by the Center of Excellence BioExcel. And uh, the, the cell level simulations uh, gap where were missing, so Permedco aims to cover this gap. So uh, Permedco uh, will provide um, cell level simulations codes adapted and optimized to work in the new generation of Prex scale systems. It will build the infrastructures to bridge the current gap between genomics, omics data, cellular models, and medical interpretation. And it will empower the, the personalized medicine community with sustainable systems easily accessible to the end users. To validate the technologies that uh, will be results of this, uh, of this project, it will validate it uh, through four different use cases uh, during the, the next three years, as Alfonso Valencia mentioned before. Um, they will be focused on cancer diagnosis based on omics information, drug synergies for cancer treatment, the tumor evolution based on the single cell omics and imaging, and uh, finally, uh, the most advanced use case uh, that is uh, precise uh, the COVID-19 multi-scale modeling of the virus and patients issue. So uh, we will expect to release uh, promising results during the next three years. Uh, thank you. So uh, thanks a lot, Elena. So I think it was very interesting because you covered like some other parts that uh, uh, hadn't been covered before by the previous uh, uh, speakers, and uh, I think it's completing a lot of the the. the like the, the whole messages. <laughs> okay, so I so let me share the screen. Again, so I would, uh, so these are the, now the presentations are over. So there is a small wrap up that I wanted, to, I would like to do uh, as well before that. Uh, one moment, I think I changed the, so be before that, uh, we have prepared one small feedback questionnaire uh, that uh, we would like to share with uh, you. And if uh, it's possible that uh, you can fill it, uh, it's going to be very helpful for us. So I will post it in the chat. So one second. Uh, okay. So that uh, we can also get like a more complete idea. Okay, so I posted uh, for everyone. So we will be uh, grateful if you can also fill in this uh, 
this uh, uh, questionnaire, okay, uh, and uh, we can also share the results with you. Okay, uh, as well as I was telling, uh, so I wanted to recall as a wrap up, like uh, what was the main name of the session? So what are the main industrial challenges in the section and how can centers of excellence uh, help to tackle them? So it's like 10 minutes after uh, the half past five that we were supposed to finish. So um, in order to make it fast, uh, so I collected some ideas that are some takeaway messages that uh, I been uh, that, that they have been flying uh, all over. So on the one side, what are main industrial challenges? So there was this last presentation by Atos that uh, was showing like many trends on the health industry and technology trends. That I think it was very uh, adequate for this as well. Uh, the COVID has shown the importance of uh, like how how important it is to tackle like. Uh, 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 the, the, the problems that, uh, that uh, such a pandemic can, can give us. Uh, and, and I think all the partners and uh, all the centers of excellence and all the companies are somehow uh, tackling those uh, problems. And as well, in general, uh, like the SMEs provided like a nice source of uh, real examples. And uh, as uh, Mariano said, uh, so that they are no longer science fictions, but uh, they, they are like real business that is uh, already done. Uh, on the other side, so there is this how center spectrums can help to tackle them. So there, there has been the uh, idea that uh, all these uh, centers of excellence are actually filling necessary gaps. Uh, that uh, in all, so the, the, for the SMEs that, uh, being part of a center of, uh, center of excellence, uh, so they can benefit a lot as well. Uh, as for external uh, parties or individuals, so there are like many offerings by the centers of excellence that are provided, like uh, trainings, webinars, codes, uh, available, for, uh, available for download and uh, use for anyone interested. And, uh, and as well, there are like uh, business initiatives, like uh, these BioXL enterprises or the at uh, Combiomet, uh, they were presenting these service level agreements or operation level agreements that they have in order to engage like, from a uh, professional point of view, like uh, industry to have uh, everything clear. Uh, so this, these are my takeaway messages. So I, I wanted to open as well the discussion. If uh, you would like to add something or you think something is uh, should be uh, expanded. Uh, so, uh, if uh, the participants wants to want to add briefly some comments. Could maybe just say a little bit. Um, I know the other COEs have sort of um, commented a bit more on their their codes and their applications. Um, if if anybody. Um, online is interested. We also have as one of our services, so under the services drop down menu, um, our software hub. And this should give you um, sort of all the information that you might need or want um, in, in regards to our applications and, and how you could use them in your own work as well. Um, and obviously then uh, contact details of, of those people who are working on those um, applications. So if, yeah, if, if you're interested in the in that side of, of the uh, CompBioMed COE, then uh, please feel free to, to have a look there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alfonso? No, well, from our side, uh, we are, as we are starting, so we have a, a lot of room for, uh, for adapting. So we are happy to hear about, uh, you know, needs and um, collaborations and comments. We are starting uh, an observatory uh, that is um, with the aim of collecting uh, additional uh, methods, software uh, applications that are interesting or are considered interesting and, and, and may be included in our workflows and our uh, working environment. Uh, 
So that can be, you know, uh, from, from research groups or from, from companies is a way of catching needs and uh, uh, from the software point of view. Obviously, we also more than welcome uh, other kind of suggestions and uh, and particularly around the training activities that we'll do together with the with uh, BioXL and the EBI MBL uh, in a way of it can to be together efforts uh, that will be a way of collecting uh, information, suggestions, potential collaborations to which we are very open. Okay, so thanks a lot. So there are many engagement uh, opportunities from what I see. So thanks a lot, uh, Rosa. Uh, yes, so, so from BioExcel, uh, yeah, if you've seen uh, our workflows and in general the tools offered uh, by the project, uh, by the center, have a good level of maturity. So in this sense, uh, we are of course looking forward to have uh, contributions from uh, industry and in general from end users. No? It's important that uh, there is feedback and that we can uh, transfer our technologies to end users. So I'm looking forward to see inputs from industry and in general from any communities. So thanks a lot. So as well, looking forward to hoping uh, from the audience or from the people that will uh, be checking this, uh, this uh, presentation later on, uh, you can raise the interest to them and then welcome to contact back. Uh, so any further comments? Question covered so far? So we got the wrap up from the Centers of Excellence, uh, the companies, if you have something to add. So, otherwise, uh, I would like to thank uh, all the speakers and the presenters like, for your time and the interesting uh, presentations done. Uh, I would like to ask uh, as well all the attendees and, uh, and also panelists if uh, you could also fill in this uh, type form, this, uh, this uh, questionnaire that uh, we presented. And uh, well, uh, apologize for these technical <laughs> issues with the website, but we could probably not have everybody to join or to join on time. But uh, we will also, as uh, it has been recorded, we will also share with all the people that had registered. And uh, we hope that we get uh, everyone the opportunity to follow this, uh, this presentation. So uh, thanks a lot uh, again. And uh, uh, yeah. okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, Bye. Maybe, yeah. Uh, let's let's share a picture. Let's share a picture. Yeah.